Okay. Uh, this chapter is on garages, apartments, and log homes. We'll talk a little bit about each one of them. Um, let's talk about garages. Notice that uh, there is no separate standards of practice on, uh, on garages. The garage door is a part of an interior SOP, so you find the garage door and the safety aspects of it in the uh, general interior standards of practice. There are two types of garages. There's attached and detached. I define the difference as a common wall. If I have a common wall with a uh, common wall between the house and the garage, then I have an attached garage. If I do not have a common wall but have a shared wall like a, uh, a breezeway or something like that, I'm still going to go with the detached. It probably has its own roof line, and um, uh, which, but sometimes you get in these gray areas. It's a judgment call. I've never received a phone call yet saying, oh, that was really attached to the house even though there was a breezeway there. Nobody really cares. You're, you're literally calling it attached, detached based upon your own prerogative. It's your freedom to call it anything you want to do. Attached garage, let's talk about that. It has a shared wall with the house, which has its own problems in terms of safety. Yes? Did you say? Oh. Uh, which has its own, um, ter in terms of safety, uh, you want to... Now, I know a lot of inspectors will look at the type of drywall that uh, is on that shared wall in terms of is it fire retardant, etc. Typically, we don't have the opportunity to take a look at the, that drywall, so I don't report on that one way or the other. And also, if that dry, uh, shared wall goes up through the attic, you, you need a fire because you do not want, uh, as is, when you went to my house, you had an attic that then that over the garage, there was no fire barrier to get into the house. So fire could start in my, uh, in my garage and sweep up and go through and affect the rest of the house. There should be uh, one of the defects with my house is that there's no sheetrock uh, separating the garage attic from the house attic. There should be some type of fire retardant wall or something. Shouldn't be any openings because that'll act as a that will act as a, uh, a ventilation system that will just draw that fire right into the house. Other safety aspects of it is the common door. That door needs to be fire rated and it needs to be self-closing. I think we lost an elderly couple just a year last year in the capital region when a um, door, they came home at night after an anniversary party or something like that, they came into the house, <coughs> accidentally left the car running, got into the house, didn't close the door behind them, went in, laid down, went to bed, never woke up again. They sophisticated with carbon monoxide because the car was running. Now that sounds odd, but I've gone into the, I've got out of my car, left the car, just not taking the keys out of it. It was running, got groceries out of the car, took them into the house, walked back out of the car, and there it is running. And I wasn't in my 80s getting close, <clears throat> not in my 80s. So it's possible to leave your car running. And if you happen to be going through the garage and not closing the door, that's a recipe for death. So, as as common as it is a, a thing that we look for, it does have its it does have its issues. So there is a reason why we want that door to be self-closing. It's not a big deal that it's not self-closing. It's just a spring. And that spring will uh, will pull it closed. So it's a fifteen or sixteen dollar spring, something like that, or a hinge, and that hinge just gets put in there and it'll pull it closed. How picky you want to be on that hinge, just uh, how does it slam it close or does it kind of eke it over there and it's a little, you know, that's your call as to the situation. Uh, fire, uh, uh, it, I call it, it needs to be just a fire, um, what's the word in the checklist? Uh, I want to, interior. Where is the interior? Oh, that's we're expecting a detached. Where's the interior for the entire 
self-closing, and then fire rated, solid core, or not fire rated. Uh, I, I use fire rated all the time. In terms of talking about the door, it's fire rated. Uh, I don't, I know, I think there's, I think Joe has to read on it, the fire rating on the label. I don't bother with that. I look at the door. A fire rated door should have two panels, a thin metal panel on each side. If I have two, thin, it, if I have two metal panels, it's fire rated. I don't care whether the, there's a label on it or not. That's just the difference between Joe and I. Also, if there's no fire rate, it at least has to be a certain thickness and solid. So you could have a solid wood door that is thick enough, like an exterior door, and that is also fire rated. Yeah, it's about a quarter of an inch thicker than interior doors. Um, but I don't, I don't recall, unless it was just an interior door, I never recall seeing a garage interior door going into the inside of the house, not seeing it uh, without the metal uh, plates on each side. So I just go for that. It's either fire rated or it's not fire rated, um, and it has to be self-closed. And also, if you have one of these garages that has stairs going down step, uh, steps going downstairs and there's separate entrance into that garage, um, you want to make sure that that's also a self-closing and a fire rated door. You can leave that one open and, uh, and those gas fumes, let's say you have a gas leak and that, that gas leak, those fumes are going to sink, they go to the lowest point and they're going to fill up that basement. So that's a safety concern defect, right? Yes. If, if those doors aren't closed. Yeah, I mean just all of that, like let's say all that, any, anything that should be fire rated, those are all going to be under the safety icon. Yes. Other than that, then uh, you're going to look at the garage door itself, the mechanics of the garage, or the mechanics of that door. Uh, make sure that that uh, electric door opener is uh, not on a uh, extension cord. It's plugged directly into an outlet. Uh, when I'm judging a garage door, I'm going to open it and close it, and when I'm closing it, I'm going to uh, break the beam for the electric light. You all know, you've all seen us do that. And, but I listen to the door. Um, if there's a problem with the door, it, the first thing it does is it gets really noisy. It's struggling. It's struggling. That's exactly right. So listening to the door is, is probably your first key that there may be something wrong. Of course, if it doesn't open. Oh, and by the way, there, uh, the last line on this is door release rope. Never pull that door. Never pull that rope. Report whether it's there or not, not whether it's opening or not. So on the uh, checklist, the bottom item there, number 22, door release rope. That's the, that's the emergency if you lost power. You just disconnect the chain and then you pull the door up so you can get out of your house if there's no electric in it. Um, but don't pull that because if there's something wrong with it, now you bought it. You're going to check your uh, uh, photoelectric uh, eyes uh, for the bottom of the door. Now, a lot of home inspectors will, and uh, I think uh, I, we used to, Jamie and I, when we were inspecting together, have the door come down and catch it right here and hold it up and see if it, see if it will reverse on its own. It's my understanding that all these doors will reverse. It's a matter of a setting, and the sensitivity of that setting. If you want to take on the problem of arguing with your client when you did that, and it came down, and instead of reversing, it folded. Now they're going to blame you for the fold. Jamie did that one time in an inspection we were doing. They blamed us for the fold, but fortunately, we had an exterior picture of that door that already showed the crease there. That was our beauty shop before we even got to the door, uh, got to the garage section. So it had already folded. They waited for us to come around. When we did that, it folded again and they tried to nail us with the purchase of a new door for them. Didn't work because we could prove it had been folded before. But it happens, those doors do fold. I personally don't do that test anymore for that very reason, that would be called invasive. I might damage it in the process. 
I always do the photoelectric eye, but I do not do the pressure test anymore. They are all supposed to, according to the manufacturer's reverse, and that is a setting. So in my mind, even if it doesn't reverse for me, and let's say it doesn't fold and it doesn't reverse, it's still going to come down to a setting on the machine uh, on the uh, on the overhead motor. So it's not like it's a big deal. It's not like it's going to cost my client money if I miss that and don't report that it wasn't returning. The manufacturer is the first person they're going to sue if it's not returning. They're not going to get the home inspector that could argue the fact that that would possibly damage the door, which it could. So I don't see how we have much liability here when they're really going after big pockets of the door manufacturer. They're not really headed after the, the home inspector that did the home inspection that didn't check that aspect of it. I'm checking the photoelectric eye that should be enough. I asked when my house was being inspected about that big crack that was in my garage floor. It wasn't a big crack, but when you're buying a house, every crack looks big. And that same crack is still there today, 19 years later. My basement didn't, uh, my garage did not fall down because of those couple cracks. Garage floors are not structural, and they're uh, going to have some cracking based upon the, uh, the quality of the floor, the concrete, and the skill of the mason that did it, and weather conditions, etc. How soon they would came in and they started. There's a multiple reasons why that floor will crack. I'm always looking for cracks in the floor because that will show me er er erosion going on around that slab. Sometimes I'll have the corner cracks, I'll have a corner come together like this, and erosion going there, and I'll have that, uh, the tip of that uh, corner is now uh, settling down. Now I do have a slab problem, but that's really an erosion problem outside. And I'm looking for, in that slab, I'm going to look for displacement. Again, erosion of the ground underneath it. But other than that, everything else, those small cracks that have just happened in concrete aren't issues. If I see cracks in the that um, in that slab, I'm going to then look for: Do I have an erosion problem, or is this just a curing problem of the concrete? It's one or the other. It's not both. Windows in the garage: Are there windows? Do they work? Vinyl, etc. You're going to report on those. And then the mechanical side of the door, you, you always want to make sure that if you have the older style doors that have the springs going this way back into the uh, building uh, towards the car, does it have the safety cable that's properly bolted <coughs> or attached at each end? I've been in a house with that freaking cable snapped doing an inspection. And then 10 minutes earlier, I'd been in the garage, got in the house, I was doing, I forget, the half bathroom next to the garage door, and I heard this bang, and I went out there, and there it was hanging. <coughs> and there, I could have been out there, so it was terrible. <coughs> they do crack, do make sure that those springs have the uh, safety attachments. Now, we don't have that with the newer doors. The newer doors are, uh, have the, Here's the garage door, the big spring that's going across the top there. Then there's no need for the safety because there's no springs going out this way on the side doors. So it's just the older side style doors that have the uh, older style doors that have the uh, springs that we need to be concerned with. I just installed the new door and had the side springs. Still? Still good. Well, people sell them. So it's just a cheaper door. Normal price? Huh. Okay, let's any questions on an attached. Sometimes you're going to have a garage, uh, an attached garage that also has an attic that you have to get up in the middle of the attic. Good luck. So those, those ceilings can be up there 
16 foot up and it's no wall around it to hatch so you're going to need a tall you're going to need a tall uh, step ladder dan what's your opinion on the um pull down stairs you have a attached garage completely yeah. you know five eight sheet rock all the way around and then you have the attached stairs which is the face is wood I don't have an opinion. I never reported on it and never bothered with it. It's, yeah. Some people say, hey, that's not fire rate. Right. You know what I mean? Because yeah. of the wood yeah. and that sort of stuff. But that technically doesn't have to be fire rated. It's the wall up in that attic section going well, what happens? The if, what happens if you go in that attic and I can go straight across? Well, that's, well, that, that's, that's the issue. That's, that's, that's not because of the... Right. Is it My house, I have exactly what you're describing. My house has the pull down stairs that does not have... Uh, a fire retardant. But there's a wall. But there's no wall. There's no wall. No okay. wall. So I'm writing up the no wall. I'm not worried about the steps. Okay. Now what happens and if there was I no attic think, stairs? What? what happens if there was no stairs and it was all, the ceiling was 5 eighths, that was 5 eighths, and the hatch inside, right, you go up and you can completely see the, the garage. I'm writing up the fact that there's no wall. Still no wall. So, don't you? Well, if, I, if the garage is completely encapsulated with 5 eighths, then I wouldn't need, I thought you wouldn't need a wall. The ceiling. I, 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 I got to, because this is related to the garage, and I get this all the time. The ceiling, I, I, that's what I was told when I did it. You can have a ceiling 5 eighths, but then you don't need the wall. It, but the hatch has to be fire rated, too. No, 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 there's no hatch. Oh, no hatch. And no, you should be good. And the hatch. I don't know. I think there's something from I don't. Don't. Doesn't the industry look at the fact that that's a garage where there's more likely to be a fire? That's or what I thought. There, and that's why they want the separation. That's what I. Th I thought you needed a complete separation but because we point out, you know, sometimes they put a window. Yeah. And they leave it like, oh, we're going to build a garage on a house, and they're like, there's the window. Like, you can't have a window. Right. No, I so, think that I think the wall between I, the garage and the house there has yeah. to be a full. In, in, the, that the garage has to be totally isolated on its own. It can't be a walk through attic. I think it depends on where you are too, because I just did a garage, and the guy made him build. He had an attic, but he made him build it a wall all oh, the way yeah. up through both. Okay. I just report there's no wall, and I say this common safety standards, and I don't. Think so the any, common wall does not exist in the attic region between the homes. That's a defect. That's not a fifteen hundred dollar defect. Well, I think there's so many ways you could throw up a wall that would qualify and not be yeah. fifteen hundred dollars. I would, uh, you know, I think if you were stretching, you probably could. You Maybe. could, you know, like you can't get the sheetrock through or something. Okay. Okay, let's talk to about move. detached garage. What's the one thing about detached garage? We know that the detached garage won't have a common uh, interior door, so all the stuff about the interior door is out the window, and um, it has its own roof. It has its own siding. That's it. So you're going to do your exterior inspection of the house on the detached garage, and you're going to do your interior inspection of the garage the exact same way you would have done for an attached. Yet you don't have that interior door, so it's not it's not rocket science. It's exactly the same thing. Are you writing up separate electrical if he's got a no breakers or a small panel box? Or? I might report on just a picture of it just to show them that I opened up the box. I'm not going to get into detail on it because in your electrical section it's going to say do you have a sub panel somewhere and that would be a sub panel okay. or a, a sub box. And there is a section that in the detached that talks about electrical. Right. If you want. Okay. So you can answer some electrical questions there. I think the important thing is not so much what you write up or but the fact that you have a picture there showing you looked at it. That just shows how thorough you were. Okay. So I'm more concerned that you actually make the effort to look at it. And then if it's deficient, it's deficient. Now remember, if you do not have a breaker out there, you better have it coming off of a breaker on the inside. Mm -hmm. But then we'll get into that in the electrical when we talk about uh, distribution boxes. I have a detached garage with a breeze room. Yes. My electrical panel for the house is in the Attachment okay. So that, that would be fine. Yep. Absolutely. And so it's just that one box. You don't have a distribution box because one of those breakers is probably running that that detached garage. Yes. Yes. So you're no problems. 
Is that is that box uh, have a main breaker in its own? Yes. Okay. You're good. I've got I've got into houses where I had the attached garage. There was just one breaker on the wall in the attached garage, and that was a 200 amp breaker. And then you go into the house, and then I have in the basement a panel that has no breaker on it. So that's a non-breaker, but they were using the feed from the breaker in the garage. So literally, my main breaker for the box was the the 200 amp breaker in the garage that was installed in a little box all on its own. So if I wanted to kill power to the house, I had to go out to the, my garage to kill that switch. And that would stop the, the power in the house. I had no way of cutting it off at the, at the panel or at the box in the basement. Put you right down. No, there's nothing, there's nothing that says they have to be together. I'm not going to write it up. I want one. I, w I mean, I want a separate breaker so I can kill power all at one time. No, and I don't see. I don't think there's any standard that they have to be at the same location. Any questions about the attached garage? Jason has a question. His hands up, but his mind doesn't have a question. No. Oh, I'm sorry. So your hand has a question. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're supposed to. I never quite understood it. Um, but then so do all basement outlets, too, supposed to be. So, uh, I, yeah, you, there's no reason not to write it up. And it's considered standard. Garages have to have. Well, garage, you may you may be washing the car or wash and, and, and have. Yeah, that's probably what. That's probably exactly what. You may be washing the car in the garage. So, yeah. When I built my garage, it was I was told you needed one outlet and it had to be GFCI. You needed to have at least one outlet. One outlet. Right. That's it. You only need one outlet. I asked them why I was doing one every eight feet. <laughs> they, they want spigots right in the garage. Spigots in the garage? Well, if I've got a spigot, then I'm going to have a GFCI. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, anything on detached garage before we move on to apartments? Okay, apartments. We do a lot of uh, two or three and four family unit apartment buildings. Um, and that's why I created in House Facts a separate section called Apartments. Uh, general interior is just so cumbersome, and uh, kitchens and bathrooms. So I wanted, because I was doing a lot of inspections with four-unit apartment buildings uh, in Albany, Schenectady, or Troy, I wanted to have a separate section that had both the kitchen, just like an apartment, a kitchen, the bathroom, and a general interior all in one section. And then I could have a group of five or six of them, however many apartments, and then just rename number each one of them. If there was a number on the door, then that's what I would use. If it was three on three different levels, you may have an upstairs apartment, a, a first floor apartment, and a basement apartment, like you see a lot in Troy and Albany. Uh, then now I'm going to rename those. And I'm going to go through and do this checklist which happens to show all of the general interiors and then the bathroom sections and then the kitchen section. And I'm going to report on that uh, in the apartment. I love doing apartment inspections because in 95% of the time, one of, if you've seen one apartment, you've seen them all. So I'll spend 20 minutes in the first apartment making as thorough an inspection as I can of that one apartment. And then I rip through the other three in about two minutes each, because all I'm going to do is walk into that apartment and I'm looking for deltas. That's engineer talk for differences. Differentials? Differences. Differences. So I'm going to walk in, and if it, typically it's the same layout, it's the <coughs> same bathroom, it's the same floor plan, it's the same windows, and if they're vinyl on one floor, they're going to be vinyl on every floor. There's very few apartments I walk into that the first one is any different than any of the others in the building. So now I'm just walking in and turning on water and making sure the stove works and walking around looking for if my deltas. That's what you might have an issue. Well, if there is a difference, I'm going to take a picture of it and now I'm writing something up. Or, unless it's not a defect, just a difference. But there, typically there's not much. 
Now, the only time I've ever seen significant differences is when the owner owned the upstairs one, and he had all the fancy stuff, yeah. and then the others that had the lower grade uh, items in it and were in worse condition. Can you explain how you and Jamie uh, tackle two families if somebody wants to partner yes. up with people? Yes. Because I find it important to have two people. When there's two people and you're doing a two family, the guy that does the exterior, it's been uh, Jamie's in my experience that it works best this way, is the guy that's doing the exterior, which would be the grounds, the roof, and the siding, and the detached garage, then does the upstairs apartment. And so he starts on the outside. I walk into the first floor apartment and I do the first floor apartment. So we each get an apartment and then I go to the basement and start doing all the systems. So I'm splitting the job right in half. Now, if I have a four or five or six or seven unit apartment building, now I assign one guy all the apartments because then it gets too confusing. So if it's a two family, you each get an apartment, and one guy gets the front half, the exterior, the other guy gets the back half, all the systems, and the basement, and the foundation. And the guy that does the top apartment gets the attic? Yes. And plus, if it's more of the two, you can have the attic for the deltas or whatever you said, because he's looking through every apartment. Yeah, exactly. Now, his, so I, I've done a build, I've done an inspection where I brought two or three guys along because I have 20 apartments, and I always do the delta, I always do the apartments. I assigned everything to everybody else because I know how important it is to keep those pictures in a particular order because your pictures have to match the apartment yeah. and I've got a little scheme. I start every, when I go to a bunch of apartments, sure. no, I, I used to show the door but I got away from that um, uh, because there's not always numbers and there are uh, different appearing doors, etc. I do, I mark on my worksheet the apartments in the order that I did them upstairs so that I know which what I'm talking about. And then on my apartment list, on my pictures, the first picture I take when I go to a new apartment is the kitchen sink. So I'll walk in and I'll take the beauty shot of the kitchen showing the sink. And now that starts, so all 12 pictures that flow after that sink are from that apartment. And then the next time I see a sink, it's in the new apartment because everything else looks alike. If you don't have a sink breaking up these sections, now you got a bedroom in one and a, and a window in another, and you get all confused as which living room is what and what defect is what. So you take your pictures. I go walk into the first apartment. I go into the kitchen. I take a picture of the kitchen sink, not just the sink, but the kitchen showing the sink. And then I go through and I do my inspection. And then when I'm done with that, I go to the next apartment, I pull out my next check checklist, I make sure I know the order that I did them in so that they'll show up on house facts right. And then I take my first picture when I walk in, I take a picture of the, of the kitchen showing the sink. Now that picture breaks apartment one from apartment two. So every sink is an apartment. Apartment one was the first sink, apartment two was the second sink, apartment three was the third sink. I did a unit that had 40 apartment buildings at one time. That that system saved my freaking ass. I'd have been there. I'd still be there today trying to figure out what apartment was what. What do you charge for something like that? Uh, hours, uh, 500 a man per half day. So I figure out how long it's going to take us. That's just you get from experience, and it's 500 a man a half day. So a thousand dollars if it took a day. And I typically a thousand a man if. So if I can get three guys in there, now I've got six half days or three years. So I think it, it depends on how much time you're going to spend. I just keep bringing enough people, so I'm never, never going to go back the next day. So like a, a two-family, you again, you use one reporting system. So whoever found the job, the, the person that's helping would go into that person's reporting system. Right. So it would all be under one report. And usually you can get it done for a two-family, like an hour and 15 minutes. Maybe a three-family, maybe like an hour and a half. So typically you might charge a, whatever a typical inspection would be, maybe like 300 325 And then you could add $75 for every If you want. I, you're you're going to find after you do a few of these multifamily units, they're easier than a regular house. Absolutely. Oh, they're a piece of cake. Because first of all, the homeowner doesn't live in it, so they don't give a shit. Is it all operating? I don't care about the condition. Does it operate? Well, that changes the whole dynamic of what's yeah. going on at the inspection. And sometimes uh, your client may be 
in a different state or, or far away, maybe like New York City. So depending on your client, if you've worked with them a lot, uh, you guys have a working relationship, so maybe the devil in the details don't have to be so much. That's but exactly. on the first time you work with somebody, you know how I know uh, Bob, for example, example, you're you're very very detailed in your explanation. So when you if your client's not going to be there, sometimes that is good to be a little bit more detailed in the explanation, so they can see that and you guys can build a relationship on. What? He's always quiet. I know. He kills me. He's thinking. I'm dying here. He's, 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 he's a man with a few words, but he's thinking. He's, he's thinking the army. Yeah, yeah, taking it in all word Spongebob. trouble. <laughs> Spongebob. Spongebob, that's it. I love you. Um, apartments. Um, there's a different standard uh, because typically when you're going in and doing apartments, they're renters. Um, so you're, you're still going to report on all the, the defects that you find. You just don't have to be, you know, I don't, I don't get crazy about the stoves because I don't get crazy about some stuff unless it's a real, a real dump. Then you want to get crazy and just write everything up just to cover your ass. But typically, if it's not a dump, then there's a renter there that's making complaints about all the issues. I love it when my renter's at home because I, the first question I ask him is, uh, you don't mind if I uh, ask you a few questions? Oh, no, go ahead. How long have you lived here? Or have you had any problems? Did they come and take care of those problems? How's the heat in the winter time? You can find out a lot from that, and they'll walk you through every problem in there because they're trying to curry favor with the new owner that may be letting them stay or not raising the rate, and they're nervous about that, so they try and cooperate. It's only the ones that the renter knows he's not staying that become belligerent. I keep changing the freaking locks. I've made three calls on apartment buildings, all because we would go for the inspection, couldn't get in because they had changed all the locks. The guy gets the locksmith there that, that afternoon, come back the next morning, and over the night the guy changed the locks again. We went three days through this dance of the renter changing the locks and the homeowner changing them back and going through the bathroom. It's tough. You don't change your rate at that point, do you? I don't go back. Sorry. I just reported it's not inspected and I bill him. I didn't inspect it and I'm not going to get it. If he's changing the lock three times, am I 100% sure he's not standing behind the door with a gun? I don't know that. Do I? I'm not. Why Why get involved in his mess? Nope. I'm staying still back. Him. <laughs> well, How much you charge? No, no. Now I'm, did I inspected the building. I inspected the roof. I inspected everything else. I just didn't get in that apartment. And I defied him to not pay me because his tenant was uncooperative. So he buys the building without knowledge of that apartment, or he walked through it and saw that it was similar to the other. I did not do my inspection. I inspected every area that it, I, I had access to. And he couldn't provide me with access with that apartment. So he paid. Not a problem. I didn't have a problem, and after after he said, I said, I'm not coming back. Okay, that's it. Yeah. I'm gonna invoice you, you'll get your report, you'll get your full report minus this apartment. Nobody had a problem with that. They all felt bad that I was coming back and I didn't try and build it for the second trip or the third trip. So by the time I pulled the plug on that inspection, nobody had a beef with me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was cooperative. It was the tenant that wasn't cooperative. So, on this uh, checklist for the apartments, notice down below where it says uh, at line 36 or 35, washer and dryer hookups in apartment in basement, none. If it's in the basement, then you're going to report it as a laundry section. And if it's in the apartment, then you're going to report it in the apartment. And you're going to have a picture of the washer and dryer in a concern box and say, noted uh, uh, a laundry facility in apartment, etc. The same with the hot water heater. That's not a hot water heater that you then find in the basement. If it says in the apartment hot water heater, then only use these answers 
if the hot water heater is in the apartment. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, the small apartments that have the small hot water <coughs> heaters under the kitchen counters. That's what this is for. If you have a hot water heater that's in the basement, you're going to report it in the uh, hot water, make it its own section in the hot water, and you're not going to answer those questions here. So, whatever you see in the apartment is reported that's what you're in this section. So, if I don't have a heating system here, I'll answer it in the basement. And if I don't have a hot water heater, I answer it in the basement. If I don't have a laundry, I answer it in the basement. Now, I may have a sub panel. Now, I'm going to report that sub panel in the section. So, if it's in the apartment, it gets into this section. If it's downstairs, then I report it under its own section. Now, I'm downstairs and I have four hot water heaters stretched out in front of me. I take a group picture of the four of them. And do I care which goes to which apartment? Not a freaking bit. I'm still reporting on each one of them. Now, when I'm in the apartments, I'm going to report one of them as not working. But I'm not going to chase down the pipe, piping from which one wasn't working unless it's obvious from the inspection. Why, label? It, why not just fix it instead of labeling? You know, it may be. You're right. They may have labeled it. I'm going to report on the age, the condition, yada, yada, and I'm going to report uh, three out of the four buildings had hot water, and, and here's the four hot water heaters. One of them was 37 years old. The other two and three were all midlife. You pick which one's not working. I don't care. Is, I, it, is it unusual to see a full-size hot water tank on the second floor? It is unusual, apartment? yes. It is unusual. Sometimes they'll be in a common area or they may have a mechanical room. I've, I've seen heating systems up on the third floor you know, at a th small third floor apartment oh. and you, you have a kind of a crawl space area and open it up there's a freaking furnace sitting there. It's unusual because it, it's on a second story then they need to have a pan and it has to have a drain that runs all the way down for it. Oh, uh, they don't bother with that. I'm saying to pass code to open up the apartment. But, yeah, you do. I'm just saying, he's asking why it's if, if, if you did it into, like, I have a list thing coming up, I've seen this. They have a second floor, and you pop open in this door that I thought was a closet. There's a full size hot water tank, and there's the unit. They have a central air unit yep. right next to it. Right, because they didn't want to run all that uh, plumbing and everything and the ductwork from downstairs, right. the basement up through there. So that was a retrofit that they just put in a small mechanical area and then they just had to run it for that apartment throughout, correct? So as long, yes, as long as it's functioning okay. Um, that's all I'm concerned about. Right. And he's right, it should have a drip pan. Sure. No, I'm not saying right up his defect because that's not on us. I was just saying that's why it's untypical to find them. Oh, right, oh, right. Set, I've never seen that before. Yeah. I've seen it uh, rarely, yeah. rarely. That's awesome. I, saw, I, I saw one in Schenectady where I had uh, the third floor apartment was, it was three heating units, air on the top apartment with a furnace up in the attic. Mm -hmm. The bottom apartment was, a boi uh, was air and the middle one was boiler. So I had three units, one installed in the attic and a boiler and a furnace in the basement. So sometimes you get these older 150 year old homes that are these big old houses and they're breaking them up into apartments and you could see almost any kind of uh, different orientation of how they're going to heat it and etc. I think that's what happened here because this is a two family home. That they're now making into a three maybe? No, no, in, in, a, in a single yeah. family neighborhood. Yes. So it's just like an oddball and they just it's, did all this. Yeah, you know. one of the doorways are all odd, yeah. you know, the whole yeah. thing. Well, what's the door coming into the bathroom for? You know, yeah. it's, it's weird stuff. Yes. Are you seeing many of the on-demand hot water heaters yet? Uh, yeah, occasionally, but not much. Not much. Um, they're still pretty expensive. Yeah. More, more and I, I yeah, becoming more and more popular, but, but only in the situations I found that where I find them, they're also taking up some of the heating duties. You're running a radiator, so a, a combo where you're doing hot water and it's supplying hot water to a baseboard system. Yep. That that uh, you'll see more than just the straight hot water heaters. Now, where I do find them is every time the city's got involved, Schenectady is doing some low-income housing that you go down in the basement, holy shit, they got new stuff everywhere, and it's nice stuff, too. <laughs> uh, 
and I'm taking pictures because I I've never seen the units that sparkly, fresh, and nice. And oh, you should see. We used to take uh, when I was doing it for eleven. We we put four by eight sheets, paint them all white. We'd have the um, combination unit hung on there, all yeah. nice and neat, and then my header coming up there, all circulation valves, all yeah. wired up to separate units, all nice with the you know. Yeah. It was really nice. And, the, and, they, and they work fine too. I don't Probably know. Right. I, has anybody heard whether they're caught as cost efficient as they think it is? I've heard the numbers. By the time you're ready to break even and start making That's money on the deal, it's time to replace it. That, wow. I love that. The issue, it takes so long for it to pay itself off because it costs so much. Yeah, but then you got the replacement cost. You're, are you ever really ahead? I think that's the issue, and I well, don't think it's been decided yet. But all right. some of the warranties, you know, <coughs> they, la they last longer than when, well, longer than the time. And warranties are only as good as what their intent was. Yeah, the, uh, is the warranty prorated? A lot of so now it's ninety percent of its life. So therefore, you're only getting a ten percent rebate back. Uh, you know, yeah, I can make a warranty sound great. They sell. Yeah, only because somebody's not reading the fine print. Well, it's, you know, and my in-laws put one in up in Saranac Lake because they have a bunch of family that comes up every Big summer, kids. and you got two or three showers, and you got ten people by So now, for them, it makes sense. There it goes. Yeah. That's exactly right. And the exactly. other side of that coin is if you've got one person living in the house, you're not heating that damn hot water heater. All day long, all nobody's home to use it. Put a road down the wall. So Absolutely. 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 I looked at them at Home Depot. I think they're between eight hundred and a thousand dollars. Oh, is that all? I yeah, they're so. they're going way down the price though. The uh, when I looked at it about twelve years ago, it was about four grand. Yeah, that's what I. Think. That's for a comedy unit. That was two thousand dollars. It's been around. Are it's they only eight grand? Uh, eight hundred now? No. The shitty one, the Home Depot, yeah. Oh. The good ones are still around like $1,800. Why do you look at Bill and say the shitty one? He meant the heating unit, Bill. Oh, okay. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> well, I think we got it. Yeah, that's all right. Well, yes. Is there anything special we should know about inspecting um, apartments with uh, like space heaters or like those stove rate range heater things? Yeah, those things are freaking expensive. If you can get a hold of one and walk out with one, do it. <laughs> you say, hey, do you want this? Because I'd be glad to put it in my truck. It'll, it'll buy you a new truck. I, those are those are in high demand. Those, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, gas on gas or heat on heat? You talking about the infrared? No, the stove no, that like serves the stove as. Within the lovely, you see, come up Troy, the all these downtown areas, um, they have require two heat systems. So what they did is they'll put a gas stove out in the living room, and then, the, and then, then in the kitchen, they'll put this gas on gas uh, uh, stove, which has a flue pipe going out, and it's half of it is a range, and the other half is just a heating unit that heats up the house, uh, heats oh, up the I kitchen. And those things are nice. Uh, so the, the, all that I know is that there are some ordinances in some towns that require two heating systems in an apartment. So I would call because none of them are dumping. It's just no, they're not. It's like having two fireplaces. That's, that's exactly right. That's all it is, and that's all that most of the municipalities actually care about in new, uh, apartment uh, dwellings. Now, I don't know why these renters aren't just throwing electric baseboard in everywhere and have their people. The electric baseboard's the answer to everything as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And they're inexpensive. They're easy to install. Jesus. Got an outlet on the wall. Man, that's a, that, that place is begging for an a electric baseboard system, but they don't always have it. And then you get these, and then they put in these living rooms and these, some of these a low income rental units, they put in these gas gas uh, heating units, the uh, stoves, or not stoves, but gas heaters. And those things have gas leaks all the time. Any other questions about apartments? So just remember, when you're in the apartment, don't fill out these bottom questions unless that, uh, the, whatever it's talking about is in that apartment. You're only reporting what's in that apartment. Now, when you're also doing an apartment uh, building, you have common areas. 
treat your common areas as just a slide any question over there you want to, or any section you want to, label it uh, a common area, and don't use the checklist, just write a narrative discussion of the stairway going to the top. The stairway is a three-level building with stairs that were that uh, a function property. It was the same stairway. There was a light switch at the bottom and a light switch at the top, etc. Yada yada. Describe it in a narrative fashion, but don't hesitate to to use a couple of section additional sections and report on those common areas. You have a back stairway which could be stairs going up back porches that take you down into the basement. That's all common area that has to be reported on. So would we, so would we uh, create our own little sections in the thing for that? You could if you wanted to, but what I do is I'll slide over a general interior question and, and don't check any uh, a general interior section. Don't check any of the boxes unless there's one or two that may apply and then just rename, retitle that section, and then open up a narrative box at the bottom, a defect box, and then describe the stairway. All, you can do what you want to as long as you don't check those boxes that are in the checklist. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Dan, does there have to be uh, more than one way to get out from a set of upper floors? Egress. I don't know. Secondary egress. That's a code question. I don't look for it. That doesn't have to do anything with the answer. I, I will look for egress issues in a basement. Joe, have you ever looked at egress for upper floors of an apartment building? Uppers? Yeah. Is the one way up good enough? Good question. Never came up. Hmm. Of course, we don't get involved in, in every time. Every time there's a, uh, a two family, there's always stairs in the back and there's always stairs in the front. And when I'm in Albany, uh, there's always a fire escape. It has, it has to have a fire escape. So, I mean, but usually a two-family, three-family, there's always that porch stairs always right. in the back. Right. Well, I've seen plenty of instances where they take a single family and make it into a non right. it, it, They don't have an ROP for it, so it doesn't meet the city's regulations. Right. But do we comment on that? Where they just take the staircase, put it in a kitchen upstairs, and there's only that stairwell, there's, there's only one. There's nothing stopping you from if you notice that it looks a little hinky in terms of that, writing it up as non-standard. Okay. That non-standard phrase will work a, a, a million times. Because now what you're doing is you're bringing up the topic and now the attorneys, the realtors all have to talk about it. But they're not making it an apartment. Yeah. They're making it an apartment. They put a kitchen in. So, but a separate living space. I mean, it, it, it's really like, tough because, like, at my father's house, we put we we put <laughs> a, a morning kitchen in, bathroom, and a bedroom. But it wasn't a second apartment. But well, it's it was originally a bedroom upstairs. In Albany, that's considered a second apartment. You will be assessed as a two-family. If you put in a kitchen, the minute you put a kitchen into something that has a bedroom and a bathroom, it okay. automatically becomes okay. a two-family, you know, an extra unit. And so. that's the thing I'm running into with the Schenectady home with the hot water tank in the middle of it. They only have one set of stairs going up to the second floor. And that's it. One call to a code guy and take care of that answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know. Albany I mean, she's she's listed legally as a two-family by the t by Schenectady <coughs> County. <coughs> what you know, especially with all the code game? issues that they were, you know. What kind of trouble are you running into? Getting it occupied? No, no, no. It, she's listing it for sale. It's just it just popped. Up. I'm not saying anything to her. It just popped into my head if somebody wanted to make an issue out of it. I think I would suggest when we when I had my first house with my wife, we had a chain ladder. It would hook on a window and go out, and that right. was sufficient to satisfy this town. I, well, no, it was a one. <laughs> no. It was a one-family house. That's what. That's what's getting me like nervous about, it's, especially with all. But the you know what? Let's, let's take a back up. Let's go fifty thousand foot view. We are not code enforcers. Right, right. We do not know about the municipalities from Albany to Cohoes. Yeah, but I don't think that's as, as concerning. He was actually. I think you were concerned about whether it was safe. Or not. And I think from a, that point we can talk about safe. Right. 
because it's it's in the tax roll as a legal to family. Well, it, it's there. I family. think somebody has signed off on it, and you saying. But it's a two-family unit, and I see two families, and so therefore I know that the town has looked at egress issues. Okay. Or it wouldn't yeah. become classified as a two-family. Would I live there? No. But that doesn't mean you have the right to turn around and make something that the town has already looked at and given the, the they're not. Somebody else gave the approval? Like the, the one house we all inspect. Remember the apartment downstairs? Oh, the one, yeah. The apartment yes. downstairs? In, in Troy. In Troy. Troy said that was a two-family. What? Yeah. yeah, that was illegal. How that was to go through some yeah, we wrote up the to get to your He house. says it is taxed as a two family. It is. So you have to go through someone's <laughs> apartment <laughs> to get to your <laughs> house. Really Plus, good. there's no egress. Yeah, that's there's exactly no egress. That's, so, that's the only answer. It could have been approved <laughs> like 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. so it was your father's And if way. you keep it occupied, you don't lose your. Yeah. How many of these houses had all this done before? Uh, the, or the building codes went in and had never been resold, so they're still grandfathered in. Yep. Does anybody work for Albany here? All right. They Albany screwed a lot of people because there was no seriously. There was about no way. There's about like thousands of houses that were grandfathered in that did not meet the the proper requirements: ingress, egress, you know, fire escape, everything like that. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they sent out letters to people. And basically, what happens is, you know, like with law, if you answer the letter, you're you're admitting to what they said. And the people who are astute enough not to answer and have their attorney send something back stating A, B, and C. Yeah, but how many senior citizens out there were in fear? That that and, and that was the issue. Let alone they had lost in court because they they were trying to make people use a specific directory, and the court said you cannot use this. So unless Albany has the record showing what they're saying it is. It has to stay. Huh. But, you know, people, when they get things from a municipality, they just run They just automatically think that that municipality has their best interest at heart. And geez, it does. What, what you learn is the municipalities <laughs> put in more illegal laws than you would, you would be so. You, you're preaching to the choir here. I mean, huh. so many things that are illegal that would never hold up in court. People just go along. Yeah. They, they think that their uh, representative is not going to do that. Okay, let's go on to log structures. <coughs> this will only take 10 seconds. Don't inspect them. Get somebody that knows what they're doing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but getting somebody that knows what they're doing, is, I'm not saying don't inspect them. What I'm saying is you actually, the you know, log structures are different. They're a totally different animal. And the sooner you realize that, then you're going to go out there and approach it with a different set of eyes. I, ha I have a log guy that does continuing education. He's on my payroll. He does all my continuing education around the state. And I strongly recommend, after you're out of this school, taking his log uh, home continuing education for, four, uh, for six hours. Uh, it's six hours of credit, and he can walk you through what you need to know in terms of inspecting a house. This is a brief checklist on page 142. Those eight lines are what he says that you need to be able to look for, that you should be looking for. I'm not going to go over it because I can't explain it. All I know is it, it, a log home has a whole different set of issues. Maintenance is a totally different problem going downtown or going uh, uh, down the road. It's a totally different problem than living in a regular house. If you do have one, I had one, and I actually called him up, and we spent about an hour and a half on the phone uh, a couple of years ago. And he offered several times for him to, he says, I'll come out there and do it with you. You don't have to pay me and that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't take him up on it, and I wish I did because I was completely over my head when I, when I went out there. Once you got out there. Once you got out there. So uh, if you really do have them, I, I would contact Dan, uh, and I would follow him. It's a completely different animal. Completely. Not not the scary or anything. You want to learn it. He's a really I mean, I've inspected homes before I knew what a different animal they were, and I got by, and you know, you're still going to go into the house and look at it, but from a structural point of view, it changes. Those, you know, you're looking for different things. Um, 
in terms of the, the way the windows are put in, yep. the structure itself. In the general interior, you're still doing the same general interior stuff that you always do. But when it comes to the structure itself, there are some issues. How do they heat those? Same one. Same one? Ductwork for furnaces, boilers, radiators. It's a lot of radiating in the cabins. Yeah. Mine's a boiler. You have a lot. I have a Lincoln log, yeah. Unfortunately, my guy, my guy used to be the Lincoln Log guy. He worked for about 12 years with Lincoln Log, and what he did was he was their troubleshooter. When a dealer out in Montana had a deal problem he couldn't handle, they called for the dealer's rep to come out, and he would go out there, look at the house, they'd go to the dealership and tell them what they needed to do. So my guy had about 15 years with Lincoln Log. And he's as close to an expert as we're ever going to find in terms of log cabins. Plus, he's a great guy. And I said that for the film, David. <laughs> You've always said that. So. I've always said that. That's correct. And just like Joe, he represents my company perfectly. He gives this course around here? Around here. Yeah. He'll do six, uh, six hours every year. I, uh, that is just log cabin that day. And that's the time. Don't come in and worry about what the subject is, because I have to title these co uh, courses, whatever. Anytime there's David Patton and you want to talk log cabins, he'll talk log homes, it. he'll talk log homes till he's blue in the face. Mm -hmm. And that'd be great if you did that on a day that we're actually advertising log cabins, uh, log homes. But he'll talk anyway. It doesn't matter. He may be doing boilers that day, but if you ask him a log home question, you won't shut him up. So I don't mean to cut log homes short, but I can't do it justice. Read this page and avail yourself of going to see David Patton at one of our continuing education. David Patton, P-A-T-T-O-N, at one of our continuing education classes. And he will take care of you. And just like Joe said, if you get a call on a on a, a, log, a log home, don't, don't not take it, okay? Just be aware of what you're doing and give David a call. We, we actually have a uh, separate checklist that we're putting together. What we're going to do is as soon as House Facts 2 is out, there will be a drop-down template that will be a totally log cabin, a log home drop-down template. That is, so you'll be able to drop down a template for a, a four-unit apartment building, two-unit apartment building, standard residential home, log home, all of them will have their own separate templates instead of just the one mold inspection will have its own template, etc. Are there that many log homes in the area? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln is in Glens Falls. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of log homes up in this area. In the rural areas, there's a ton. Like they're going right. to burn and, oh yeah. You know, Queens, you go up places like that, you catch them all over, litter. You know, you never believe it's that many. Yeah, Adirondack Park, they're as common as fleas. Yeah. Right. Yeah, really. Yeah. The prices are starting to get a little bit more reasonable, too. I just always thought you'd be cold. Well, there's yeah. different levels of log homes. There's log homes that just have the fake the, log on the outside, all the way down to total log everywhere that you look. Some are half log on the outside, but everything's drywall on the inside. Some of it's a full log all the way through. So there's a lot of variation on it. So just I want you to remember, don't when somebody calls you up and you happen to find out that it's a log home, Know that you're in for a little bit different and prepare yourself. Uh, even if they don't tell you on the phone and you look it up on the MLS a day beforehand and you're getting your drive time down right, you're creating your checklist, getting your pamphlet together, pack it together, and you find out you have a log home that you're going to be going doing, make a couple phone calls and be prepared for the log home. Don't treat it with fear, but treat it with respect because they are different. Trust me, I, I inspected six or seven of them before somebody told me about all the things that I should have been looking for and I didn't. Yeah, and I'm going around like this. Oh. I'm still waiting for the phone call. Uh, way off topic, what is the statute of limitations on that phone call? I don't believe there is. I, it's never been codified. It's never been, there's no, uh, there's no, um, uh, uh, 
president. There's no president in terms of what, what is good and what isn't good. I think it's a matter of did he reasonably just really seriously, you've been there nine years and you just found out now? I think that'd be a hard case to sell. I always read the easy once a year's pass because if he hasn't noticed it in the first year, now he's been through the house through all four seasons. So my, my statute of limitation runs out after a year. But that doesn't mean the judges, the juries, or the clients. Good question. Excellent. Anything else? Anybody else? Any of this? No, I'll just no. I was just thinking the log cabin. Home, log home. As David Patton keeps correcting, log home, you idiot. That's his exact words. Okay, are we good? Yeah. Thank you very much. Every time you say it, I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>